Servus Malzrocker, es ist Donnerstag, alles ist möglich Donnerstag und heute und ehrlicherweise nächste Woche auch geht es um Insterny. Es wird nämlich ein zweiteiliges Special werden. Insterny ist eine Destillerie, ja da hat man jetzt noch nicht so wahnsinnig viel davon gehört, ist noch nicht so wirklich der Begriff, aber ich bin mir ganz ganz sicher, dass das in nicht allzu ferner Zukunft sich massiv ändern wird. Im ersten Teil das ist das, was jetzt gleich kommt. Gibt es ein Interview mit dem Destilleriemanager Scott Snedden. Und äh, das Interview wird mein guter Freund Stefan Bügler im Wesentlichen führen. Ich bin sozusagen Begleiter. Das liegt einfach daran, dass Stefan sich wahnsinnig viel schon mit Insterni beschäftigt hat und einfach viel, viel cleverere Fragen stellen kann äh, als ich. Da wünsche ich euch viel Spaß. Das Interview ist leider in Englisch. Nächste Woche gibt es dann am Donnerstag ein umfassendes Tasting äh, mit Stoff von Insterni. Das meiste Zeug ist davon leider nicht erhältlich, weil Insterni aktuell schon zwar an Unabhängige durchaus was abgibt, dort findet man das dann unter dem Namen Strathenry, aber sie haben eben so ein solides und sauberes und stabiles Geschäftsmodell, dass sie zwar ihren Stoff rausbringen könnten. Wir haben es probiert, das 3-4 jähriges Zeug dabei, das wäre absolut abfüllreif, könnte aus meiner Sicht auch durchaus mit Abfüllung wie mit Negnin, Bimba, was auch immer mithalten. Aber sie brauchen den Cashflow nicht, sie werden ihn auch die nächsten Jahre nicht brauchen und deswegen sagen sie, unser Inugo Release gibt es genau dann, wenn der Whisky fertig ist und keinen Tag früher. Und deswegen wird es halt vielleicht noch eine Zeit lang dauern, aber es wird immer mal wieder andere Dinge geben. Aber das werdet ihr alles sehen. Ich wünsche euch jetzt mal mit, äh, viel Spaß mit dem ersten Teil, Interview mit Destillery Manager Scott Snedden. Nächste Woche dann großes <lacht> Insterny Stofftasting. Bis dann. Genau, <lacht> haut rein. <lacht> So, hello Scott. First of all, I'm really happy that you are here. I will give a uh, especially on, on Malts and Metal on my YouTube channel. Uh, so just to give a short introduction to, uh, to, the, uh, to the audience. Uh, Stefan Bügler is a great friend of mine. We know each other for, I think, 10, 15 years. I do not know. And we've been oh, for 10. 10, 10 years. Um, we've been to Scotland several times, helped uh, already a lot of uh, whiskey journey uh, uh, together. And now we are really happy that we have uh, Scott Snedden um, here in our call for, uh, for an interview. Uh, Scott, you are the, I think, master distiller. No, I wouldn't go as, as extreme as saying master distiller. I'm the distillery manager. The distillery the manager, place. sorry, the yes. distillery I'm, manager I'm, from Germany. From I would say I've got a few more years to get under my belt before I would even consider using the master distiller uh, terminology to describe me. Okay, so the um, so maybe then we are right in the right in the beginning. I would maybe maybe Scott, you want to talk, give a short introduction on Insterni, especially and and on and, and your person, and then I think we we will get into the flow, huh? Okay, well <clears throat> I'm Scott Snead, and I'm the distillery manager at Insterni Distillery. Uh, Insterni Distillery is a fairly new distillery. We've only been operating for five years come Christmas. Uh, we are based in the lovely Kingdom of Fife uh, in Scotland, so just north of Edinburgh, uh, for those that don't know where Fife is. Uh, and as I said, we're coming up on our five-year anniversary. And as we'll go along, we do things slightly different to what you would Anticipate being a we're not a traditional distillery, and we're probably quite different to all a lot of the new distilleries that have been popping up uh, in the last couple of years as well, uh, which we can go into in more detail. Okay. Okay. Do you Great. want a little bit Thank of information you. in that? Yeah. Super. Um, okay. Shall I take um, Shall I take over now, Jochen, and just say? Um, would 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 be absolutely fine. Would be absolutely fine for me. Okay, right then. Okay, well, um, yeah, Scott, you just said that um, that Insterni is a bit special. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Insterni a few times and could really see it was very special. Um, could you share with Jochen and his viewers what is so special about Insterni? 
I, I would start off by saying what is so special about Industry Energy Distillery is, apart from the people and the location, is that I alluded to is that a lot of the new distilleries that have been uh, formed in the last you know, five years, they've had a lot of uh, visitors attracted to them. We are slightly different in our business model and uh, that we have a strategic partner. So about 75% of what I produce on site goes to support the brands of my strategic partner. And the remaining 25% is then my, our own products uh, that we, we can do. The equipment that we use is quite innovative. Uh, we don't have a hammer mill and the traditional mash tun. Uh, we've actually got a, a hammer mill and we've also got a mash filter. And mash filters are traditionally used in the brewing process. And there's only one other distillery in Scotland, uh, Tina Nick Distillery in the Highlands. They're one of the ones that use uh, a mash filter uh, for producing the, the spirit. Also for us, we, the philosophy behind the business is flavour. Flavour is key to us. So if you can imagine that a traditional distillery is just one product all year round, you know, we do various campaigns throughout the year and produce about seven different uh, types of spirit uh, throughout the year. Uh, and we do this through utilising the equipment we have, uh, but also using different cereals, using different yeasts, uh, and also different uh, distillation process. Uh, so that's kind of what makes us a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you said you, you have a strategic partner um, that takes about 75% of your production. Um, so this uh, basically goes to the blending industry, if I'm right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, our strategic partner is a company called McDuff International. Uh, so their products are uh, Lauders, Grand McNish, and Isla Mist products. That they're very prevalent in the Nordic uh, part of the Europe. Uh, so we support their products. Okay. And, um, and basically you set um, yourself apart uh, with your own products, with the different yeasts and uh, the different distillation times. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I mean, we, as I said, we do different campaigns. So we do uh, four campaigns throughout the year uh, for our own malt, which is will be Inchterney malt. Uh, we also do a peated malt, which is called Clean Glassy. Uh, we also do a rye uh, product, uh, which is a single grain whiskey. Uh, we call Rye Law, and we do that for two weeks of the year. And then we have two weeks of the year, which we call our Prin Laws collection. And that will be, again, looking after flavour. So that will either be through looking at different grains, different grains and yeasts, different distillation process, or even down to the maturation. It's all, it, it, the best way to explain it is I get two weeks to tinker uh, to really understand what we can do in the search for flavour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, flavour sounds good. Um, so I guess we go into a bit more detail about um, the different makes um, that you distill. Um, so, but in terms of flavor, when do you think can we experience the flavor in an official in an official bottling of any journey? I would say at this moment, our philosophy has always been we'll only release it when it's ready, rather than defining that it's going to be X amount of time. Because the distillery is only five years old, we are still learning and understanding how our products mature. Uh, we believe that the first product will be the rye products or rye law whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking to do that in either 2022 or 2023. Uh, it's really, we're looking after it as it's maturing uh, and it's maturing very well, uh, but we'll release it when we feel it's reached its optimum capacity. Yeah, well, I'm, I'll be um, very, very happy when you release it because um, I have the sample bottle here and you can already see it has quite a, uh, quite a bit of color. And I think the taste is absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm not really sure what you're waiting for, but uh, I can't really wait until um, this bottling comes out. Is this the so, rye, um, rye whiskey, Stefan? This is the rye whiskey here, yeah. Okay, and it's and matured the, in a sherry, obviously in a sherry, sherry cask? Or? No, new wood. Virgin oak. Oui. Virgin oak. Okay, then yeah. I really, do, will we have this uh, later? Absolutely. In we absolutely will have this later. Okay. And I can, I can only say, um, Really look out for it um, and wait for it. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic combination. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the general introduction, Scott. Um, we're, we'll be looking at uh, the rye a little bit later. 
And um, I think now it's time um, to look further at uh, the different new makes that Inchden is producing. Okay, uh, I suppose the, the the first one, I suppose the best one to introduce is what will eventually become the Inchderni malt. Yeah. And like I alluded to earlier on, uh, we were, the approach that we're taking for Inchderni is a seasonal approach. So we do four campaigns throughout the year, and for simplicity, they're basically done the spring, the summer, autumn, and the winter. Yep. Uh, so I have, and, I have spring, spring and winter here. So that's the yep. spring and winter. Yep. So, so you can see what we do for each of those campaigns. Uh, we do for the spring and summer campaigns. We use normal spring barley, and it's fife barley uh, that's being grown locally. Uh, and what we do is we use different yeasts with those combinations, and we're also using different wood profiles. Uh, for the spring and summer. In the autumn and the winter, we use winter barley. Uh, and again, we use different yeasts for each of those and also different wood profiles. So the best way to, if you can think of all year round, you know, when we come into spring, people, you know, the, the outside starts to come to life again. So people start cutting their grass. So for us, the, on the spirit knows it's like freshly cut grass of the new make spirit. And it's very light, uh, the spirit as well. So what we do with that is we marry that in with some nice uh, ex-bourbon cask and ex-wine cask because we don't want to overburden the, the whiskey uh, profile in the background. Uh, the, the summer ones, were the yeast that we use, we want to get some of that flowers, some fruity notes and a little bit more cereals coming through. And again, we use some ex-bourbon wine, but we also use some of the muscatel uh, sherry cask because that's got lovely elderflower note that brings to it. We think that will complement uh, the the noses that we you know the flowers and all of that that we we have in the new make spirit. When we go into autumn uh, and winter, we use a uh, winter barley. Now traditionally, most distilleries do stick with a spring barley. Uh, we use the winter barley, and we found with the winter barley that we through the mashing process, it's. Uh, we, we go from a, a lovely clear wort to a bit of a cloudy wort and the, the turbidity, so the amount of solids in it increases. And what that brings through is it brings a lovely malt notes coming through. It's like a field that's just been cut, newly cut. So you get that malty cereal notes uh, coming through. And what we do with that spirit is it's a lot bit lighter than the summer one. So it can take stronger flavours that we might coming from the wood. So we put that in wine casks, but we also put it in some uh, Andal Andalusian fortified wine casks. We can't call them sherry because they're not done in the sherry triangle, but it's still using the same principles of the sherry triangles. You know, we, we look at uh, Paolo Cortado, we look at Oloroso, we look at uh, Pedro Jimenez. And what we're looking for is that's going to bring out some nice dried fruit flavours. Uh, so for that element, it's, it's the body, nice body of the, the underlying spirit, but a lot of these dried fruit flavours that you get from the cast. When we go to the winter run, it's a little bit more cereal notes. It's a lot uh, more, I would say it's a heavier product. And because of that, we, we do it in some, uh, under the same wine, but we also do it in some wine and port casks. Again, it's pulling through all these different notes from them. No, we're, like winter spice type things. And that comes predominantly from the cask, but the new make spirit can cope with that. I don't know if you've experienced before that some distilleries that they try and use their, their, their same base spirit that can then uh, lots of variations in maturation. And sometimes it works really well, but sometimes it doesn't quite work. So what we've tried to do is we are trying to match our new make spirit with the type of cask that it's going to end so we can get the optimum balance. Uh, and at this moment in time, uh, the philosophy being that we'll then put four seasons into one bottle. So we'll do a combination of spring, summer, autumn and winter that will then come into a, uh, one bottle. And by that, I'll give you a lot of complexity and a lot of layers uh, and not be one dimensional, but multidimensional. Uh, it's, that's the philosophy. We have been... Uh, you know, consistently doing the new make spirit because it's we came up with the concept that we've been able to prove it. 
you know, you can see significant differences in the pneumatic spread itself. And then with the different casks that we've been using, we can see the different flavour profiles coming through as it matures. We reckon it'll be about 12 years before the, from start to finish that we'll have a single malt, but as we said all along, well, time will tell. And one of the, I suppose, unknowns is we've only been doing this for five years, is how that complexity will come together. It may be that there's some of the flavour types doesn't quite meet our requirements for the final product. We won't really know in, as, until time goes on. You know, if you think of all the current distilleries, they're big brands, they've been at this for you know, over 100 years. Yeah. Uh, we've only been doing it for five years, so we've still got a long way in our journey to get there. But the concept that we're looking for, because of the, the equipment that we have on site, and our, uh, we want to investigate and go after flavour, we feel that we're getting that within Sterling product. Mm -hmm. Scott, you just mentioned that um, that when you say the, um, let's say in other distilleries, you have, a, a, let's say, a pretty, uh, uh, let's say, more or less... Uh, a constant character. That's why some spirits uh, do really uh, mature well in sherry casks or in bourbon casks. And honestly, I'm, I'm totally with you. For me, some some spirits just simply does not work in a bourbon cask or in a sherry cask. Why yes. um, is But one question. So I understand that you have a little bit of risk mitigation uh, by having a strategic partner in the plant industry. But how do you think, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty, pretty innovative, let's say, approach to say, uh, let's do all those kind of searching and hunting for the different flavors. Um, but how do you expect, let's say, how the customers then have the possibility to say, okay, this is journey, this is what journey stands for when you have so many, let's say, different, uh, later maybe so many different kind of styles. Yeah, I think for us, it's about the four seasons in the bottle as the concept or after. So it gives you that multi-dimensional flavour profile uh, within it. It's not, you know, as, as we both all know, when you take spirit from your the initial, you, you nose it to then you taste it, it can change throughout that time. And that's where some whiskies you take it and it's very quickly dissipates away. So we're wanting a product that as you know, it, it's changing as you're tasting it, it's changing it. And as you're drinking the glass, each mouthful is changing as well. So to build that level of complexity, we have to almost build it up from the ground up. So by having the different styles of spirit and different casts, it gives us a portfolio of spirits that we can then pull together to see which works better and what not. We have a lot of ideas of what we think will be the end result but we have the portfolio of the spirit to be able to build on that. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds, to, to me, it really sounds uh, crazy in a way that you say it's only uh, in 12 years time when, when you think this will be ready because at about four years old, um, to me, this is already, if you give it in, away in a blind tasting, I'm sure people would rather um, tell you it's, it's 10 to 12 years old. So. Um, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to what's happening there. You know, personally, I'm really an advocate for not putting, well, for putting four seasons in one bottle, yes, but also supply a set of another four bottles of each season. So uh, everyone can try to, um, to make a, a blend of the seasons himself. Um, I think for, for whiskey fans, that, that will be really awesome. Um, so I, yeah. I, I, would be, I, I would be thinking five bottle kit, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, another, that's another story for, I guess, in 10 years' time. Um, just, just a last question on, on the, on the Inchdani whiskies in comparison to your, uh, the Strathenry new make that is basically the unpeated new make that you sell to the blending industry. Um, how does this um, differ uh, from, from each other in, in the flavor profile? Is that possible to, to uh, say? I would say the f in the flavour profile, uh, I mean, we, we're fortunate in with having a strategic partner uh, to, to be able to do their blends. We exchange our uh, malt with other distilleries and we get receive their malt on site to make up the final blends. So we get to experience a lot of new make spirits from a lot of different uh, distilleries. And I feel that, you know, in Stierney, not because I, I work for them, I think it's a very 
broad. It's a it's a new make spirit. I get bits of fruitiness. I'll get bits of floral. I get some cereal. I get quite a lot. There's quite a lot of uh, detail within the actual Strathenry uh, spirit. And be because of that, I think it'll work well in a lot of blends because it'll pull a lot of it together. Mm. I might bring different facets depending on what blend it goes into. But I also think it's strengthened. This won't re really get realized uh, for a few more years. I think it's a good starting point. That it'll give a lot of good complexity with a variety of different casks. I think mm. it'll help itself in quite a lot. Where it's different, I suppose, the best way to explain Strathairn and Inchdairney is you could tell that they're related to each other. Mm -hmm. The, the, the Inchdairney itself, you can tell there's a relationship there. The, the Strathairnry is more of a distant relation in the nose. It doesn't mm -hmm. have, whereas some of the other ones are a lot more subtle and delicate. And the, the winter ones are a lot more fuller bodied. Mm -hmm. The, the Stratenry is it's quite a light spirit, but as I said, it's got various elements uh, to it. Mm. And it's it's the Stratenry is used in you know, standard uh, spring barley and standard uh, distilling yeast and mm. done through our wash still and our spirit still. So mm. it follows the same routine as everybody else. And mm. it gives a, it does give a unique, distinct flavour. Mm -hmm. But for us, we, we wanted to be, for the inch journey, we wanted to make it a little bit more special. So for inch journey, we do only use five grown uh, barley. Mm -hmm. uh, we use our own special uh, yeast and, a f and different different casts because the bulk of the spirit that we produce for Strathenry uh, will go into maybe uh, you know, refill casts or you know, have ex bourbon, but not very much more than that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the inch journey, we felt that that was desi de designed and developed to be able to go into the different wood profiles mm -hmm. for that specific mm -hmm. requirement. So, I mean, as a, uh, if I'm honest, Strathenry in its own is a really, really good malt. As a, mm -hmm. spirit, as a new make spirit, it is really nice. It's very sweet on the taste as uh, well. And it's one of the, the few new makes that I've been able to you know, sample and nose and taste almost at full strength. You mm -hmm. don't get the burn that you would normally get mm -hmm. uh, from a lot of other ones. It's not harsh. It's actually quite quite nice as a new make spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I, I'm looking forward to uh, the magic of um, independent bottlings um, that somehow will, will bring the Strathenry, um, I guess, to the, to the whiskey fans as well in a single cask. Yes. Definitely, so, um, and that's basically what I think your your boss in Palmer also is is uh, uh, saying that basically, hey, we bring a quality product out, but um, whatever the rest of the world is doing with it, we're fine with it. Um, yeah. We're concentrating um, on Inchdarney, and I think there you did a really really good job. Yeah, and, it was also um, we we that we, we we use the same focus and level of uh, you know working through it for Strathenry as we do with Inch Dairney. Mm -hmm. Strathenry is by no means the forgotten child. No, we produce it 75% uh, percent of the time. And when we are on it, we're wholly focused in producing a consistent quality product because we, you know, Strathenry is our product, but it still comes out of Inch Dairney distillery. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we're looking for that consistency, uh, mm -hmm. good product. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, absolutely, uh interested when the first uh, Strathenry actually hits the shelves, um, which I think will be earlier than, than Inch Journey itself. Yeah, I think it will be earlier. There's a few independent bottlers uh, do, do have it, so look out for mm -hmm. it. And I reckon in the next couple of years, you'll maybe start to see it start to come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. If, if it ages as well as the Inch Journey, I think um, it will be sooner rather than later. Yes, I think if, I think if it gets mashed, uh, matched with a very good quality cask, Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think it'll work well in both you no know, ex bourbon, ex uh, sherry, or even some ex wines. I think it's mm -hmm. got a good foundation spirit that could cope with those different mm -hmm. cast types. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we we'll see this soon. Um, shall we move on to another spirit? Um, shall we go to the King Glassy? Yeah, King Glassy for us is the one of the campaigns we do during the year is to make peated product. Uh, and for that, it's called King Glassy. Yep. How, how did you find it when you nosed it, Stefan? 
Well, I, I know the, the, the new make first, of course, and I thought, bloody hell, um, I'm further west on the, um, in the Hebrides in the south, um, that little island called Isla, um, where I, I had the pleasure to, to know them and taste a few new makes. Um, and I thought, wow, this is, this is very, very close. And um, then this sample here actually blew me away. Um, out of an Isla cask, um, 2017, so just about three years old. And um, I was smelling something that I didn't smell on Isla for quite a long time. Um, and to me, that's um, the art bakes of the 1970s. I mean, that's really a, um, a big thing to say, but yes. um, this, this really reminds me of that. And um, so um, can I already put an order in for, let's say, a, a a box of six bottles or something for your first uh, release because I think this is absolutely fab. How did you how did you get this um, this this really Isla style at at twenty percent uh, at twenty ppm basically? Yes, I mean what what we were looking for is uh, you alluded it to yourself and Isla. Uh, peated whiskey is very much like Marmite. People either love it or hate it. Mm -hmm. so it's quite an extreme, quite a polar discussion. When people think of Isla whiskey, you no, know, they talk about you no know, the phenols, but they also talk about being medicinal. MD from the UK talks about TCP, mm -hmm. uh, which is a medicine that you could get when yeah. the 70s and 80s and to the 90s. Uh, and it's to, where we are different is we didn't use Isla peat; we used mainland peat. So it's from mm -hmm. the highlands is the peat that we used. And what that brings to it is it's not as much the phenolic intensity is not like you would get from Isla. It's mm -hmm. more on the nose, it's more like a smoking fire, you know, the smoke mm -hmm. you get from a fire with the embers and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's not overpowering the taste, but you do know that there's a peatiness to it. Mm -hmm. With the with the King Glassy, we're thinking about how we're wanting to mature it. You can allude to it that we've been using some uh, ex uh, Isla casks. We've got other casks that we want to try uh, because of it being a new product, you no, know, it's only mm -hmm. five years old. We mm -hmm. want to understand what wood profile works best with it. Mm -hmm. We've got a few ideas and how we want it to mature. So uh, it's mm -hmm. an ex bourbon that's also that's from from Isla, but we're also looking at other casts that will go straight into it mm -hmm. because I think the flavour profile it'll hold its own in some stronger flavours. But that's something that we're only really looking at now. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you said, we want it to be a, an approachable peated whiskey because you get some whiskies that are so high in phenols that unless you really like it it'll just blow your head off mm -hmm. uh, so at 20 ppm is it's enough to make you know you've got peat there but not too much uh, for people to, who don't like it to not like mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. um, yeah I think um, well to me I think there, there's a lot of peat and smoke in there but it's um, actually very gentle still it's, it's very yes. very full but very gentle um, is not is, and it's not really into your face. So it's it's um, it really like sitting in front of a, a nice peat fire. Um, yes. And um, and so this, this this stuff is yeah. absolutely fab. I think. I think the challenge you we have, as you've alluded to, Stefan, is that when it goes into the casks, that we don't lose that underlying spirit. Mm -hmm. We don't want the wood to over uh, mm -hmm. to uh, overload it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, for that very nature, when I the new make spirit is like that, sitting in front of the fire just with the, the ember smoking away, and it's trying to replicate that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even as a new make spirit, it's quite sweet. It's mm -hmm. you know it's new make because it is quite harsh, but it's getting the right combination of wood profile that will over time that will remove that harshness mm -hmm. that won't ex remove the the smokiness too much. So it's getting that right balance uh, in the wood profile. So that mm -hmm. we don't lose what we've put into the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, in comparison to your um, peated, um, the thin glassy um, that that you do for the blending industry, um, is that similar a similar approach like you do with uh, Strathenry and and in Sterney? Uh, it's the, what we started doing is when we produced the uh, thin glassy at the very start we got a very good feedback from the customers who received it. So we didn't want to change that profile. 
So the fin glassy that we do now is the same as the fin glassy we did at the start. The king glassy we have tinkered about, we've tinkered about with the mill settings uh, and the distillation settings, just because we want the, the phenolic compounds to really shine a little bit more through. Because mm -hmm. I want to put it into some different casks, I want it to be able to hold its own. So mm -hmm. we try to make it a little bit, so it is different in how we produce it because of the, what I'm looking to do at the other end. Whereas the, the fin glassy will just go into standard refill casts or even first after bourbon casts. So mm -hmm. and it'll be work really well in that because mm -hmm. we want to be pushing the king glassy in a different direction. This, this mm -hmm. spirit had a subtle change so that it could still hold its own mm -hmm. without the wood interfering with it too much, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The best way to explain it is it's a, probably a sister and a brother relationship. So they are related, but are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But I think you should adjust your camera a little bit. Um, Sorry. Down, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. when, you, when you said you changed a little bit the setting and things like that, do you have an example like saying, okay, we are for, we use a lower temperature in stilling or longer distilling in this was well, the, the, impact. The, the example we used is we used a different screen size in the mill uh, and that gave, a, that gave us more in-depth flavours in the, the washback and in the distillation I was changing the cut points uh, so I'm getting a lot more flavour at the lower end so by doing those two combinations, uh, I ended up with the King Glassy, which I felt was a, you know, a more intense uh, flavor profile to what we got with uh, the Fin Glassy, which suited my requirements for what I was wanting to do. Mm -hmm. So it's just really, the best way to explain the process is we've got different levers. You know, each of the unit operations, you can class as a, a lever. So it's just about playing with the different levers to see what the impact it has in the flavor profile and learning from it. You know, we, we never stop learning uh, on the site, so we're still evaluating, assessing the mm -hmm. base conditions for what we're trying to achieve in the flavor of the spirit. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great, because honestly, everybody's talking always about the, the cask uh, and the influence and the age, and, and sometimes it's just like saying, hey guys, look, if we're just pushing it a little bit more into the veins, the character is totally different. So that's why I asked, so thanks. Yeah. And the thing, I, I suppose one thing to remember is because of the, the phenolic compounds within the spirit, you can go a little bit lower in the cut points without going too fainty. Because I you know a lot of people know that that faintness gives you a lot more flavor and a lot more texture in the, the, the mouth as well. But it's a double-edged sword. If you go too far, then yeah. the faint will come through. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I would only try and do it with the peated product because I know I've got that scope to be able to do it mm -hmm. with the Strathenry and Ninch Dairy. We want that as clean as we can be. So they're, more, they're up at the higher end and the lower end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, yeah, I guess on to the specials. Huh? I think uh, what Ian Palmer told me uh, is that, that he was doing some research and came about some papers from about 1908 and um, was, was looking at um, some papers there where uh, uh, it was on, on track record that um, also oats and rye was, was being used in, in Scotland during that time. And um, so shall we look at the, uh, the print laws 2019 um, okay. made of oats? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the concept or the, the, the paper was a, was a Royal Commission. Uh, from 1908 and during the Royal Commission uh, they went around the different distilleries were taking notes of what they had in their stores and the uh, rye and oats were commented as being that. So we took that as our starting point. Uh, so the, the print laws uh, collection which what we're talking about is where we get to experiment with something different and it may be something that we never repeat again. We do it once and then that's it. But the, the print knowledge collection is, a, is you know, we can look at the different operations as I spoke about. So maybe we do something different with the grains, which we, with the, the oats and the rye is one concept, but we can also think about with the distillation process or we, we start and play about in the maturation process. It's all about looking for different flavors. Mm -hmm. 
So we, after we had found the elements of oats and rye, we did some research and work uh, with other uh, establishments just to profile and do some tests uh, on how they would operate. And uh, I don't know if you saw it when you were here the last time, Stefan, we actually have a pilot still on mm -hmm. site. Yep. yep. Uh, so what we did is we had the, the wash uh, created elsewhere and, it came, and so while it was fermenting, it came to site and I did the distillation of it. And we, as soon as we did the distillation of the rye, the flavor profile that came out of it was so different to what we had done with the Strathenry. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, it was fantastic. I'm not going to lie. The flavor that came out was absolutely tremendous. Mm. And then when we did the oats, again, the flavor profile was so different. You no, know, oats brings a creaminess mm. to the flavor profile. Uh, and also on the nose, it's like nosing some porridge oats, which is a traditional Scottish uh, breakfast. Yeah, just enjoyed it many times. Uh, the, 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 the oats uh, smell coming through the new mix, but it is fantastic. So we knew by doing in the pilot still that we had, by using those uh, different cereals, uh, that we could try and replicate it on site. And what we have found with the pilot still, if, if it's really good, on the pilot still, it's even better when we do it for mm -hmm. full scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in 2019, uh, we did the oats, and the, it's the the mash bill that we used is malted barley and the oats. It wasn't just 100% oats. Mm -hmm. So it's about between 53 and 56% oats is what's in it. Another component is the malted barley, uh, and when we were processing it, it was very much like learning it again because the oats is a, the density of the oats is significantly lower than the malt. Mm -hmm. so as it went through the mill, we had to put the oats in first and put the heavier grain on top mm -hmm. so it would push it through the process. Mm -hmm. We had to do a bit of alteration to the, the mill settings to be able to process it. Mm -hmm. But once it's through the hammer mill, the actual mashing process, it was, it was actually quite, quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the oats and the combination of the oats and the malt processed just as easy and just as good as we did for mm -hmm. all the malt. We had a special yeast uh, helped through the development of uh, with Maori uh, that brought out the flavours and we'd done a lot of that work in the trial based and then the, the fermentation was fine. Uh, where the print laws for the oats and for the rye differs is then in our distillation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a traditional wash still and a traditional spirit still, but we also have a loman still. And the loman still is basically the base of a traditional pot still, but on the neck is we have uh, bubble plates. So it's very much like a calm still. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can then control the strength of the spirit coming off the still. So we, and by using this still, we created a lovely light, delicate, Mm -hmm. uh, spirit that is full of flavour mm -hmm. and uh, full of really nice mouthfeel. Uh, and I can absolutely relate to that, um, especially the um, the print loads with the oats. Um, I, I'm still hearing the song Whiskey for Breakfast that Robin Lang was playing, so I can absolutely uh, imagine this one and the porridge in the morning. Yes. Um, Always drink responsible, Stefan. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> responsible drinking in the morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, what, what could you have a better Sunday? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, and um, yeah, this, this absolutely is, um, is an absolutely different profile. Um, yes. One question I have about the oats is, as far as I know, they, they are likely very, very sticky. So that, that means you can, you can process it in, in, in your distillery with your equipment, but um, very likely a traditional distillery cannot. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the oats, as I said, the, the, the oats that we used was very light. The, the, mm -hmm. the density of them was very light. Uh, and because of that, we, we did a bit of thinking about the process and, the, and with our mash bill to really get the most out of the, the grain. Because if you put too much in, we wouldn't have enough room in our grist case mm -hmm. because of the volume of the mm -hmm. new. But it's one of the benefits of having the mash filter. The mash filter can cope with a lot of grains and processing that traditional distilleries wouldn't be able to do. And 
you know, we alluded to earlier on, the rye is a very, very good example of that. Mm -hmm. Rye grain is very difficult to mash. It's got a high level of beta-glucans mm -hmm. in it. So it just holds on to the water. And uh, we, when we did it in 2016, uh, and we announced to the world that we were doing it, uh, we had a lot of other distilleries contact us saying that they've been doing it. And every one of them said, yeah, we did it once, we might not do it again because it was mm. really difficult. You know, some of the distilleries were talking about that where a normal mash would take about five hours. It was, it was being stuck in the mash for 12, 14 hours mm -hmm. and having to be dug out. And mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, some of them, that they did it in year one. And when we went to do it year two, the mashmen were saying, I want you to be in holiday when you do it again because it was so mm -hmm. difficult to process. Mm -hmm. we, by having the process that we have, the, one of the differences in the mash filter is that we, we have a conversion vessel rather than a back, the mash tun. We have a conversion vessel that's a steam uh, coil on the outside of it. So we can do different temperature profiles. Mm -hmm. So by having that, we, were unable, we, we could mash in at a far lower temperature so that we haven't denatured the beta-glucanase, the enzyme that will break down beta-glucan, mm -hmm. because that's actually only about 48 degrees. Mm -hmm. And once we achieve that, we can then heat the mixture up to you know, 63 and a half to then get the gelatinization of the starch mm -hmm. from the malt component as well. Uh, so by having the system that we have, it gave us a lot more flexibility to, to mm -hmm. cope with the difficult grains that mm -hmm. struggle with a traditional distillery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds good, um, especially with, with the equipment that, that you have. Um, and basically, from what I understood, the rye law, um, it's a product you produce every year, um, but rather the, the print loss with other oats is uh, something that you'd only do as a one-off. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. When we, we did the rye, the, the liquid that we produced was fantastic. I mean, I, mm. I, I, mean I, I know I'm beating my drum about it, but it's so different and so wonderful. Even mm. the new milk spirit is delicious. Yeah. So because it was so different, and as it was maturing, we realized that it was something to be cherished and nurtured. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to do it every year because we fully believe of the difference in the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to take anything away from the oats. The mm -hmm. oats is a really, really good product. Uh, the problem that we have is I've only got one to two weeks a ye year to do my print loss mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of different other products out there that I'd like to try. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the, the oats we only did once. And I said, we may mm -hmm. repeat it again and we know we've learned a lot from it. We might try and do a different variety of it or mm -hmm. something completely different. But the rye for us, it's kind of encapsulates what we have with the equipment on site that we can mm -hmm. year in, year out, mm -hmm. produce a mm -hmm. quality product. Where mm -hmm. we, and again with the rye, we use the Loman still. So it mm -hmm. produces a very light character spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're maturing it in virgin oak casks. The, the sample that you've got is the wood came from the Ozark region of America. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequent years, we've been looking at wood from different uh, regions of America, mm -hmm. uh, just to see how the, the, the spirit matures yeah. uh, is it, you know, on the site, because it's, yeah. a, it's very much a learning uh, for us mm -hmm. as you know, seeing how it, how it matures over time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting you said you thought it was ready now, uh, we're seeing how it matures because it's trying to get that optimum, the, the, the interaction between cask and spirit. The, because it's a virgin oak, there's a lot of interaction. That's why you get the lovely colours. There's a lot of vanilla coming through uh, on the taste. Uh, but when I nose it and taste it, I can still find that the, the spirit in the background is still a bit young. I want that interaction with the wood to you know, bring it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Made it a lot more balanced because I think it's a, although it's a wonderful drink, it just needs to be settled a little bit mm -hmm. uh, more. Uh, so that's where the extra couple of years of maturation will really tone it down a little bit. Yeah, but that's always the the envy of the whiskey fan with respect to the distillery manager that he has a lot of samples um, that he's able to assess. Um, so um, I'm 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 very happy that Jochen and I will have the pleasure to to assess this one um, later on. Um, but to my nose already, um, I, I would al always be afraid that uh, the wood would be um, too big a factor, um, that it would be just um, smothered by the wood. So I think that's, that's likely a, a very delicate um, path to follow, I guess, and, and to supervise. 
Yeah, that, that's exactly it, and that's why we're and that's one of the reasons we're also looking at different uh, areas of uh, wood from America, because mm. although it's American wood, American oak, each of the different areas will have provide a different uh, cell stru structure to the actual wood itself, and it's getting finding the wood that might give the optimum balance mm -hmm. uh, that we're, we're looking for, and uh, and that's what's exciting about it is as time goes on, we, we won't really know until we, as we know it each year or every mm. six months just to see what the optimum conditions are for it. Mm. Well, um, I can honestly say with, with all the, the nice bottles that, that we have here that Johan and I get to taste later, um, I'm just just uh, very intrigued that you gave us the chance to to assess the spirits, to, to really get an idea what Interjourney is all about. Um, I mean, I've, I've been there and was also able to um, know a few things on site. Um, I can absolutely relate to, to what you have said about Interjourney being like a, a walk through the different seasons. Um, and I was totally amazed when you first poured them for me and really put me into the different seasons, really incredible. Um, if I look at the Kinglassie that I, that I didn't get to taste at the distillery, to me, um, I was running around my apartment, shaking my head and, and you know, shouting out in disbelief. Um, I said, like, bloody hell, you know, how can they do that? Um, the, the, rice, uh, the rye and the oats, um, I think, are a, a very, very um, interesting and interesting, I mean, really uh, rather excellent um, way to, um, to broaden your range. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, what comes out as a final product. And um, yeah, I can only say um, Insterni is, is something to look out for. And um, the one thing you, you made me uh, um, a little bit more, more easy about is, uh, or feeling a bit more easy about is the running clock on your, on your website that kind of runs up to 12 years time. Um, doesn't seem to be the real time when at least the RILO comes out uh, a bit before. You mentioned 21, 22. Um, I'm really looking forward to that and um, yeah, can only thank you for all the samples and um, the talk and give it back to Jochen. Absolutely. So, and now I am really looking forward to, to try because you, Stefan, already had the chance. Uh, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, uh, Stefan, for leading through this interview and making the preparation and the contact. And Scott, many, many thanks for taking the time giving us an introduction on Inch Journey, and now I'm really curious to, to try. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, because it's really good when, you know, as a site, we firmly believe in everything that we produced and what we're trying to achieve. It's very good when it's reinforced with someone completely independent who's got no, no, no. And especially you're standing that if you didn't like it, you say you didn't like it. Mm -hmm. The fact you gave such positiveness, it just reinforces the, what we're trying to achieve. We're going in the right direction. So yeah. I'd be very interested, Joachim, who has never knows any of it or tasted any of it, to see if you see what I see and what Stefan sees, given that a better understanding of what we're trying to achieve in sight, to see if you can see that as well. Yeah, yeah. great. Absolutely. That certainly will be interesting for our whiskey hearts. No worries. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. And as I said before, I look forward to seeing you in Sterney hopefully next year. Yeah, uh, yeah hopefully. And we can maybe even let you see some of the other maturing samples, you know, a, a lot, probably a year older than what you last saw, Stefan. Mm -hmm. We can then see, see how it compares and contrasts with what you're trying to know mm -hmm. the direction it's going into. Thank you.